Andreas Detta. Uh, he's the co-founder of Broody and Partner Tree Consult in Munich. His uh, main occupations for the last 20 years have been in consulting, teaching, and research. Uh, Andreas helped develop a static load test for standing trees commonly used in Europe and has then trained arborists worldwide in, in how to use this pulling, method, pulling test method that he co-developed. Um, Mr. Detta has carried out research projects on tree stability and on the risk of tree stem failure, and together with his colleagues has developed software solutions to assess tree risk using non-destructive methods. So, uh, Andreas, if you, um, if you start sharing, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'll try my best mm -hmm. and uh, oops so first thank you very much for the invitation and uh, for the organizing of this this workshop can you hear me clearly now is the microphone okay yes yes we can hear you okay thank yep. you very much um, yes, and thanks for the introduction. I'm, uh, I started as an arborist, a climber, basically. I did, studied landscape architecture, and through the work in our consulting practice, I got more and more involved also in research. And um, this is now uh, a big part of my work, uh, basically using, applying the results of the research in training consulting arborists in the pulling test method. This pulling test method was developed already in the 80s in Stuttgart by Dr. Wesseli and Günther Zinn. Uh, we uh, helped to develop this method further with, uh, especially with uh, establishing standards, how to uh, carry out pulling tests and develop software um, in order to analyze the results. Um, my topic today was uh, how relevant is the wind and tree interaction for our tree risk assessment as consulting arborists. So um, different from Barry, we are usually working with individual trees in an urban setting. And uh, what I heard already today from Sentil uh, about the models that are available in Singapore, this is something that we dream of. But uh, generally, um, most of the trees that we have to assess only uh, experience a visual inspection. This is probably in our practice, 99% of all trees. So these advanced inspections where we use uh, devices uh, like the pulling test are only very few trees. For the risk assessment for trees, we've got several international guidelines you can all read that, so I don't have to read that up to you. This is just from Germany, uh, from the UK, and an international standard. Um, these are the guidelines for arborists who inspect trees, but also for arborists who carry out the um, device-based inspections or uh, assessment methods. If we carry out tree risk assessment uh, and Unlike what the image here may imply, this is not something that children and any child can do. This is my two-year-old daughter doing tree inspections with me. Um, if you do that properly, you would try to integrate your knowledge about the biology of the tree, the biology of the pathogens, which mainly are the wood decaying fun fungi who uh, compromise the stability and the safety of a tree with the knowledge about tree biomechanics that we have. Um, other than uh, standard structure, man-made structures, the tree is a biologic, bio, biological structure, a living structure, and um, it's exposed to an environment that's often harsh, uh, especially if it's trees in urban areas. They've got all sorts of stresses that they have to deal with. So when we do uh, an assessment of a tree, with the main focus on risk, still the biology of the tree and the pathogens are important. With the biology of the tree, I mainly talk about the compartmentalization of damages, the ability of a tree to shut off uh, infections by uh, what we call coded walls. This is a term developed by Alex Chaigo already, uh, oh, that's 35 years ago by now, I think. 
uh, biology of the pathogens. This is the spread of decay, the type of decay, and the speed of the fungal infection uh, inside the wooden body and the deterioration of the wood and its load bearing capacity. And tree biomechanics is what we're involved with today mainly in our webinar. Uh, it's got the two sides of the wind load and the strength of the tree. And whenever you carry out even a visual assessment of the tree, you will keep in mind also these biomechanical parameters the wind load the tree is exposed to and its strength, and we'll come back to that a little bit further. I will want to start with some um, devices and methods to assess tree risk. These are now the um, device-based methods. Uh, a very old tool that's still being used is an increment core drill where you extract uh, a part of the, of the wood that you can actually then look at and you can identify the uh, thickness of the residual wall. You can identify the uh, spread of the decay. You can actually also carry out tests on that small increment, uh, uh, on that small core, which is a little bit difficult because of a lot of um, problems with testing small specimen. But if you have a decent number of specimen, you can then uh, get, quite, get an idea about the wood properties uh, the diameter of the hole that you're making is rather big with around 10 millimeters. Uh, the next development were drill resistance devices where you measure the resistance to drilling a needle into the wood with a smaller diameter. The problems are uh, still um, similar with the wounding of these coated walls. There was a, a scientific research, a paper done by uh, Francis Schwarze and Kirsten Baum. Uh, who showed that there is a spread of decay into the sound wood along these drill channels. The next problem with this approach, you want to assess the shape of the stem basically. You want to assess the inner state of a stem. And in order to get a good picture of the distribution of sound and load bearing wood, you need a certain number of drills. Otherwise you would, if you drill on the left side, uh, in this picture here, you would get the same result for all these three cross sections, which are very different in their strength properties. Less invasive is a, a method that's being established in Europe and also all over the world by now since uh, 1999 mainly. Uh, we bought our first tomograph, sonic tomograph in 2001. In this method, you just have to uh, penetrate the bark and access the xylem. There's a, there are nails being placed on the wood. And then as you knock with a hammer on one nail, this machine records the uh, time of flight for the sonic impulse from one nail to the other ones. And if you measure correctly the geometry of the stem with the different positions of these nails, you get from time of flight uh, divided, uh, and not divided, you get the distance divided by the time of flight and you get a, an apparent speed of sound, an apparent sonic velocity. This may change due to cracks in the material, due to decay pockets in the wood or larger cavities. And in this picture up there, you see that we presume a direct connection for the sound impulse from one nail to the other, but it's deviated. So it has to uh, go for a, a longer distance and then the apparent sonic velocity is reduced. You knock on all these nails and then you get a, a grid, uh, a net of different uh, flight paths or apparent flight paths with their apparent sonic velocity. The darker uh, lines are quick and the brighter lines are uh, slow um, sonic velocities. And then you can calculate from this what we call a tomogram. This is one device that we are using the other devices. The principle is basically the same. You just compare the sonic velocities in this cross section. Um, you have problems, of course, because the sonic velocity is different in radial direction, tangential and along the axis. 
So you have to make sure that you have one cross-section layer and that you also take into account the difference between the quick, quicker radial spread and the slower tangential spread. And you have to avoid the quickest um, direction of um, sonic velocity, which is along the axis uh, parallel to the fibers. So you need one layer. There's a, another tomography method that you can also use, which there, as far as I know, for uh, application to trees, there's only one product. You apply an, an electric current between two of the nails and you measure the voltage between pairs of the other nails. And then you get a picture of the electric impedance within the wooden body, which changes with moisture content, chemical composition and fiber structure. So you have a second means of identifying uh, the, uh, the structure and the quality of the wood. And if you combine those two pictures on the left side, we have the electric impedance with uh, a moist center and a moist periphery. The moist periphery is the, basically the xylem, the sapwood. And in this case, we see from the sonic tomogram on the right side that there is a large cavity, which is not empty, but probably filled with deteriorated wood, um, which forms a very good um, uh, habitat for, for many tree species. Also, these, this technology in certain tree species helps avoid uh, errors. For example, cracks in the wooden structure may uh, give the appearance of a central cavity. And then with the help of the electric resistance tomography, we can identify that these are only cracks and not really central cavities. From those pictures, um, it is possible to calculate strength loss. This is Daniel's, one of Daniel's uh, last uh, publications. Uh, sorry for borrowing this without asking. Um, but what is done there, you calculate the strength loss due to a central cavity uh, in different directions. There are also other uh, softwares that you said. This is from the Arbotome, which is also a sonic tomograph, where the evaluation also gives relative strength losses, uh, which you can see in these different colored lines. And then there is the option to use certain thresholds of strength loss. Uh, the most widespread strength loss formula is correlated with Klaus Matek's work. Uh, you see a distribution of different degrees of hollowness and then the rate of failure of broken trees starts when you have roughly 30% strength loss. Um, this formula has been applied for, or this uh, threshold has been applied for a very long time, very widespread in all over the world. And it has been criticized a lot because of the experiences that have been made with applying it and losing many trees and also with the databases. Um, these criticisms have been published and we don't need to discuss it here. Um, a um, an, a um, hold up, an overview of the different thresholds for strength loss was given by Brian Kane in a paper with other authors. And you can see these are four different uh, thresholds. And there's this 30% threshold uh, uh, line where many authors uh, consider the tree a hazard if it's more than 30% strength loss. In this case, if you just apply this threshold, you avoid uh, studying the wind and tree interaction because you just study the geometry or just study the strength loss in the stem or in the root system or wherever, and then you identify hazard trees. The problem here is, as we talk about wind loads and wind and tree interactions, you are aware of that, that we have certain site conditions, we have tree size parameters. Um, Barry just uh, elaborated a lot on all these different factors that are come into play when you assess the critical uh, wind speed for trees in forests. In our urban areas, in our urban trees, in ornamental trees, we've got the same problems. These are two different situations. One tree is sheltered by buildings, has a narrow crown and slender stem. The other one towers above the houses, has a large and wide crown and a very thick stem. So if you apply the same strength loss 
uh, threshold to this, these two trees, you just ignore the very different preconditions. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is the idea that trees are self-optimized adapted structures. Barry, you also uh, pointed that out. This is very true for trees that grow in competition within the forest. They adapt to their wind environment. When we have to assess trees, individual trees, ornamental trees in an urban setting, for example, we cannot really presume that they are self-optimized trees. If they were all self-optimized, we wouldn't have to inspect trees for risks because then they would be adapted to the wind situation. And there's a big, uh, also still a discussion whether they adapt to chronic wind events or whether it's they filter the chronic wind events and just respond to the stronger events. Um, what we see in our practice is that trees are growing in their environment and there is no real zero point where we can say now the tree is optimized and then it continues to grow. It doesn't stop to grow. So at what point is the tree optimized? When does it have the perfect strength, 100% strength is perfect and then the strength loss could be calculated from there. Actually, trees respond to wounds. They establish their hydraulic capacity. Mature trees are stimulated much more by biological um, uh, parameters uh, and they generate a surplus in strength, uh, especially in senescence when they lose parts of their crown, when they reduce their height. So it's clear that we cannot really identify when this tree on the right had exactly the strength that it has to have on that side, uh, depending on the wind exposure and the crown uh, size. It's virtually impossible. On the other hand, this surplus of strength is a benefit as soon as strength loss occurs. Uh, we talk in this case about the basic safety factor, a term that was introduced by Dr. Vesely. And if you just compare those two trees, uh, 50 centimeters diameter on the left side, on the right side 100, the same crown size. This is just a hypothetical example. And now we are losing strength by central cavities. The strength loss is this 30% strength loss, a value, this threshold that we talked about. But because the diameter of the one on the right is double the diameter, the initial strength of the stem is much greater than the one on the left side. So when the wind comes and they have similar wind loads, due to the larger diameter, the basic safety the surplus in safety due to diameter growth is actually a factor of eight. And now you're losing strength. I always compare this, if you, if you know that you need $1,000 to make your living within a month and you just earn $1,000, if you lose 30%, you are living in poverty. But if you earn $8,000 a month and you also need only $1,000 to survive, and you lose 30%, you're still a rich person. So it is very relevant. What is the starting point for strength loss? And the basic safety factor is an idea that may help to solve this problem. Um, these are data from our wind load assessments on this basic safety for one tree species only, European oak. And you can see that the basic safety increases exponentially with stem diameter because of this effect that we just saw. It's basically the cross-section modulus that increases with the third power of the diameter. But at the same time, of course, the wind load increases because trees get bigger in, their, uh, in height and get larger, uh, larger in height and get wider in the crown diameter. Uh, they also change their properties, becoming stiffer and so on and so on. You can also see the higher trees are further down in this. The larger dots are the higher trees. The shorter trees, uh, less high trees are the smaller dots. So with increasing height, of course, you have less of these safety surpluses. Uh, there are simple methods to assess this basic safety and start with strength loss calculations from there. Mm, this is tree calc, a software that we developed. You have to pay to use this. It's not very expensive. And if you like, for those who do practical tree assessments, you can try out this software. You just go to treecalc.com 
and use this promotion code. And there is also a free of charge method, the original SIA method that we just uh, developed a little bit further, which was developed by Dr. Vesely again, which is also accessible and that's free of charge. Basically, we're now adding the wind load to the picture. Mm, this is uh, based on engineering principles, like any other structure would be assessed. You estimate the strength of the structure. In our case for the tree, this is mainly stem diameter, wood quality, strength of the root system, and structural defects. All the parameters that are also in the four scales model, they all come into play here. We are not doing in this simple approach, we are not looking so much at uh, the gap sizes, at the, the actual um, uh, uh, soil properties. This is all not done in these simple approaches, but at the same thing as in uh, the, the forest uh, applications, you have on one side the strength and you need the other side of the metal. You need to balance this with the expected wind load. And here we've got site conditions and so on. Then if you compare those two, the estimated strength and the expected peak load, you get what we call a safety factor, like it is being used in engineering. One application where all this is done uh, implicitly, it's one method that combines an assessment of strength with an assessment of the wind load, is the pulling test method, method or static load test. The experimental design is rather simple. You've got one tree on the right that you want to um, uh, make a judgment on risk, and then you perform a pulling test, a winch test, just like the test that um, Barry has just shown, and then you we use elastometers, which measures, measures strain, elongation, or compression in fibers. We use inclinometers that measure the tilt of the root plate, and we correlate these data constantly with a force measured by a force meter that also measures the rope angle. The evaluation of the fracture strength of the stem yeah, the resistance to, to fracture is based basically on beam theory. Uh, if we bend uh, a hollow structure, the big advantage is that furthermost, furthermost out from the neutral, at uh, the furthest distance from the neutral axis, we get the peak deformation. So if we place our astronometer at the periphery of the stem, if we have a sufficient accuracy and resolution, we can establish a force versus uh, strain uh, or stress versus strain correlation and then assess from there the elastic behavior of the stem. The extrapolations that we do are only to the proportional limit where this elastic behavior is uh, ending and we've got a primary failure in the wood. There are some citations here that I'm happy to share when we share the um, PDFs of the presentations that I uh, cooperated in on identifying what happens when the tree exceeds the proportional limit when elastic behavior ends and plastic behavior starts. We've got irreversible deformations there. With the inclinometer, we assess the, the tilt of the root plate. And here we only char load the tree to a quarter of a degree inclination to be sure that it's a non-destructive test, that we do not do any damages and then we extrapolate from the load required uh, to these low inclinations to the actual maximum resistance of the root system. And here we also find good correlations with tree volume. Like Barry just uh, explained, diameter squared times height is the best indicator for the strength of the root system. So we also collect this kind of data and Barry, I'm really happy that you initiated this exchange that we share the data that we have from our pulling tests. And I saw in your instrumentation, we may also be able to use your data for our purposes if you are willing to share. The other side of the metal, the wind load assessment is currently done basically based on uh, the detailed procedure in the Eurocode, which is also according to the international standard for wind load uh, as, or wind action assessment on structures. We use this model that's displayed on the base, a point-like structure, and we have we are using statistical wind data on wind speed and wind structure. 
which is detailed in the euro code and its national annexes. This is Germany, wind zones in Germany. We need adaptions for urban wind flow and the exposure of a tree. And in the first talk today, uh, I saw that Sentil has a very, very uh, sophisticated model for that, which we wish we had. And then we also need to take into account the dynamic interaction between trees and gusts. And here we use um, the German Euro, the German wind code because of the model that I believe is best uh, mirroring what's happening in trees. Still, these models are based on uh, a single degree of freedom oscillator, which is a limitation. Um, the model is based on the idea that we have a mean velocity profile and then variability due to gusts. And when the structure is hit, in our case, for example, this forest tree, we get a maximum deformation. It's like a, um, you take a, a flashlight picture of the tree when it's deflected the most. And this deflection is basically what you what you replace by a static pull. So you, what you generate by a static pull and the force that you need or the load that you need for this maximum response that could be uh, visible in a sequence of gusts. This is called the equivalent static wind load. So the dynamic part of the wind tree interaction is based on a calculation in this German wind code, which gives us a likelihood for oscillating, which and may lead to resonance or damping. Especially our urban trees, they usually have high life crown ratios. So the crown is very low. They have a lot of branches. So the maximum responses are usually less than you would expect for a forest tree. I have a small part and I hope I can do it. I will not over, uh, over uh, stretch my time too much. I even saw today many answers to the questions that we still need to know. Uh, we lack knowledge about the interaction among trees and groups and avenues. And here, uh, bury your data that you just collected in these uh, urban forests and tree groups may be very interesting to understand how they interact. Also, um, Dan, you have published already papers with your colleagues on uh, wind resistance in different crown structures after reduction, after storm damage, during tree decline, we may have differences in wind resistance. The effects of the built environment, that was covered in the first talk, how that changes wind speed at tree level. I hope we get access to that kind of software for our European uh, locations. I know only one city in, in Europe where they have that detailed uh, um, information and can really um, calculate the changes in wind speed. I wish we would get away from a single degree of Freeman model that is currently still being used and we would have more knowledge about damping and energy dissipation in trees. If we talk about uh, the wind reduction, the wind action on trees, I think this energy um, approach could help a lot. And let me just give you some example for that. If we have trees in a row, if we have two trees standing next to each other, it would be interesting to understand the change in the wind action on the subject tree as we have one adjacent tree, two adjacent trees. And we are currently carrying out a study with the, uh, with a, uh, in the wind tunnel in Telch in the Czech Republic funded by the SAG Tree Static, which is an asso association that I chair. We try to um, foster the, uh, the information, the knowledge about these kind of uh, properties that we need for assessing wind actions on trees better. The wind resistance, we know that um, the wind resistance depends on the wind speed. So the porosity of the crown changes, the reconfigurations in the crown, streamlining and fluttering effects. There's a lot of literature on that already. Uh, I think everybody agrees that the main parameters are the porosity of the leaves or the mass of the leaves and branches and the flexural stiffness of the parts in the periphery mainly. So we know there are differences between tree species. On the right side, you see a birch with very 
small diameter fine branches and they can bend and flex in the wind. And it would be absolutely interesting to study more the behavior after reduction pruning, for example, or as the tree is in decline. These interactions may be better assessed with the vocal coefficient, but this is an area where it is very difficult to carry out studies uh, because wind tunnel studies on small model trees usually cannot mirror the behavior of a real tree. The wind effects in the tree layer, this is a very old uh, sketch uh, about the, um, the wind uh, structure around the building. Of course, you can imagine that this is information if we assess the tree uh, next to a building, we need to understand this. And I understand in Singapore, you have already a very sophisticated model for that. The dynamic modeling with the single degree of uh, freedom oscillator lacks in a way the typical behavior of a tree that we see in tests. This was a test that I did already quite long ago with a test set up according to Ken James uh, um, experiment with two elastometers basically. And you see this, this ball of strings. Uh, and what we see there in this blue line, especially that there's a circling behavior. The tree is not bending just one direction and, and, and back. So it's not two dimensional, it's three dimensional. And this circling growing response to a sequence of gusts is very important to understand. And I believe that the approaches that, for example, Dirk Schindler from Freiburg and his colleagues are following with a model where we have um, a stick slip mechanism so that the, um, the, the restoring forces that the trees uh, develop as they bend are correlated to the wind action, the action of the wind pressure and uh, the energy absorption by the tree. And then you can also generate similar behaviors without requiring uh, the single degree of freedom oscillator and resonance model. Um, the energy absorption of the tree is, I think, a key to further studies. Um, wind is energy, it's being abs absorbed by the tree and then forces are exerted on the tree as the energy of the wind is absorbed. The forces are dissipated within the tree and then there are effects of dissipation, for example, the fluttering of leaves. There are studies that uh, we have now in wind tunnels. We have mass damping of branches. Uh, I refer to Ken James' work already from the uh, first century of our, of, the, of 20,000, the, 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 the <laughs> This our our uh, millennium, so to say. So it's already work that's 15 years old. We also understand that as the forces are dissipated in the tree, uh, strains and rotation in the root plate are generated. And here we have also um, mechanisms of damping. There's, for example, a study that is not published yet, where we inclined the tree more and more, and we studied the hysteresis in the soil as we release the tree. And you can see that even from small inclinations, 20% with higher inclinations up to 60% of the work that you put into the tree is not restored uh, because it is lost due to the movements in of the roots in the soil. Um, just to finish up, sorry, maybe just one more minute. Uh, tree motion sensors avoid many problems. These are sensors that measure stem-based rotation in natural wind events. They uh, can sample data over several days, and then you can extrapolate with wind tipping curves that refer to regional wind speeds. Uh, the problems here that you is are that you require a certain wind speed for reliable extrapolations which means you cannot test the tree instantaneously. So if a, my client comes with the question, is that tree still stable or not? I would have to tell him, I, we have to wait for the next storm. And then typically he will say, well, after that storm, I know it by myself and I don't need your test anymore. We have used this 
testing device to uh, try and mm, check our wind load assessments with this Arbostat software, we get quite good correlations. And, uh, but it's only very few studies that have been done here. And I would look forward to get access to data that we can use to check the reliability of these uh, current wind load assessments. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward for a lot of questions and sorry for exceeding my time. Uh, not a problem at all. You barely exceeded and uh, the subject matter was worth it. Um, thank you again, Andreas. Thank you, Mr. Dutta, for the talk and, and we'll now proceed to the, the next segment for the Q&A. Um, as a reminder to audience members, if you have any further questions that haven't been addressed already in the Q&A, please submit them via the, the Q&A button and upvote any you see interesting. Um, also, if you upvote any answered questions that, that you uh, would find interesting, we can, we can reiterate them to the, to the speakers during the session. Um, if now, if I could ask all of the speakers from today to share their camera and, and come back on screen, um, we'll start. Okay, I think we have uh, everyone here. So thank you all again for your talks. Um, to start off with, let me go to the Q&A. Um, okay, the highest voted question that I would like to ask again um, was from Sinyu. So this was, uh, uh, Canon have such models? I think this applies to both, um, both to uh, Barry Gardner and to Sentil. Uh, have such models be used to simulate wind effects on rooftop trees? to guide provision and anchorage solutions for high-rise greenery. greenery. Uh, Barry, you've also already answered this once in the text, but would you mind reiterating the answer? Uh, yes, uh, it's a really good question, and of course this is going to become more and more important uh, as we seek to keep all these cool using vegetation. Uh, the forest scales model will, will not work in such a situation. If it, there's assumptions in the model, the tree is inside a stand, a forest stand. Uh, I think the flow distortion over a building around the building is so severe, you're going to have to use some computational fluid dynamics. So I see, think the uh, central Kumar's approach and using uh, CFD is going to be the way to calculate the wind loading on, on such a situation. But even with CFD, you've got, you're going to have problems because you're going to get um, flow separation, you're going to get vortex shedding and so on and building. So it's a tough problem. Forest scales will not answer that. It can maybe deal with trees on the ground in an urban environment, but they're not on rooftops. So I'll, I'll hand over to Central to, uh, to, for his uh, response. So Central, uh, within the software, is it possible to place trees on top of the buildings and to uh, can we the from there? Uh, yes, I think uh, ideally you can place and uh, uh, it's I think the position which is taken and then the uh, tree cuboid, so as long as the CF model handles, handles it correctly, uh, we should be able to handle such cases. Yeah. I think uh, an interesting part that, that Barry mentioned in his answer, and that also applies to us that do CFDs, um, was one of the questions from Ronald Chan. So um, he asked how uncertainty due to the boundary conditions and the rain are quantified in the simulation. Um, so if I can help answer this from the CFD point of view, and then uh, through the answer throw it to Barry. Um, from CFD, we, we don't, include the uncertainty within the simulations at the moment, um, mainly because this is, is, is fairly new in terms of research, let alone when we're trying to develop software for applied use. Um, and, uh, and, and to do this kind of uncertainty quantification, we require lots of simulations in general in order to quantify how, how one uh, change of one parameter affects the spread of the results. I know um, for, for Dr. Gardner's code for tree gale, uh, for forest gales, it's a little less computationally intensive and possible to run lots of simulations in a, in, in a shorter time frame compared to the CFD. So uh, Dr. Gardner, is this something that you've been looking at for forest gales? Is it something you're interested in, in seeing how 
some of the uncertainties embedded within the model affect the output? Yeah, there's actually, uh, Tommaso uh, Locatelli did a, a very detailed sensitivity analysis of the model. And it turns out that some things that we thought were really important, like uh, the soil type and the root 